work with work with and help our clients um, navigate their own challenges through the pandemic. So as part of that process, PwC as a firm has been doing, and I mentioned this to Deborah at the outset, a lot of listening to its own employees, but also our practice, our people and organization practice globally and within Canada has been doing a lot of um, listening to and surveying our clients and their employees to really understand their perspectives and particularly the evolution of their perspectives throughout the course of the pandemic. So um, what I wanna share with you is based primarily on the findings of an office worker survey that we conducted. Um, we engaged Angus Reid Group to actually survey their population to be able to help us understand these kinds of perspectives. So you'll, you'll see both employee and employer perspectives in this. But I also wanted to um, bring some of the other breadth of PwC survey results into this because I think it tells a richer, rounder story. So there'll be snippets here and there of our organizational culture story. Um, so we've also conducted, um, I'd say mid to fall last year, uh, a global culture survey through our PwC Cats and Back Center. And we surveyed roughly about 3,300, I believe, clients globally. So it ranges from CHROs, CEOs, uh, COOs, so a variety of different responses that we got particularly, but also their employees, so that we were able to balance senior leadership and employee perspectives on this. Um, and I think there may be also a smattering of a couple of other surveys we did last year, including a field worker survey that we did. So with that, um, as Deborah said, I'll do a little bit of chat. I have a few slides in here, but I'm really going to focus on one or two of them and certainly draw on the others as might be needed based on your questions. So I want to present to you five workforce trends. I'll share with you some thoughts about what those actually mean. So really the bringing it all together part. And the questions, please, um, as I gather from Deborah, this is a fairly informal format. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the discussion. So let's start with the trends part of things. And this again really comes from the um, most recent office worker survey that I mentioned to you. So first, productivity continues to ramp up. I don't think this will be any surprise to those of you on the call, but you know, with an additional year of the pandemic under our belts, um, basically, because Angus Reid actually surveyed this previously, basically what we're seeing is, is that both employers and employees are seeing productivity continuing to increase essentially. Or said another way, there's also a, a, a basic recognition that productivity is not dropping for them. And so, in fact, we saw about 41% of employees are really more likely to say that their productivity has increased through the course of the pandemic. And by way of um, comparison, 32% of their employers would also say that productivity has increased. And even if there are, you know, you're probably wondering what's happened to the other 70%, there is a big galvanization around that midpoint that says productivity has probably stayed roughly even the same. The basic message here is, is that people understand and believe that productivity has continued to increase over time. So the second trend is really around employers and employees seeing emotional well-being though as a challenge. So Productivity has continued to tick up, but clearly, and I suspect many of you on this call have seen perhaps firsthand experience, but certainly seen in your clients, in your co colleagues and coworkers, that well being um, continues to be something that many people are struggling with throughout this remote working environment. Especially emotional well being is really top of mind we saw in this most recent survey. Uh, both employers and employees alike are seeing it as a top issue for them to actually address. So in that context, 
we saw 46% of employees and actually 43% of um, their employer bosses viewing mental health as a top concern throughout this pandemic. And I should say, while that figure is based on the office worker survey, we know too from our field worker survey that well being and mental health was clearly a priority in that context as well. The field worker survey that I'm referring to was conducted as well in 2021, probably about midway through the year. And so, you know, we know that this is an, an issue, it's a challenge um, and an opportunity for organizations, both those who have a significant field staff or a frontline worker staff and those who are predominantly in the office. Our third trend is really about the fact that what we're seeing in terms of people's views of leadership, perfect, leadership effectiveness is really starting to differ over time. So when the pandemic started, I think that what we saw, whether we're thinking about our political figures or our own bosses was, we were probably all a little bit more um, enamored of and a little bit more ready to endorse what our leaders were doing. Over time though, what we've seen, and there's a variety of sources that really speak to this, we've started to see that sense that leaders are doing their best with this start to erode over time. And I think certainly some of that may relate to the other things that I just mentioned, whether it's people you know, working to excess, whether it's um, the, the mental health and the wellness challenges associated with that, you know, we're very clearly seeing that employees well, they still think, you know, generally that leaders are, are doing a pretty good job. There's a bigger gulf between how they're perceiving the effectiveness of their leaders and how the leaders are perceiving themselves. So in that regard, we saw that 83% of employees, you know, they're still saying that their leaders are doing a, a pretty decent job around navigating and managing the whole remote work situation. But that actually compares now to 92% of employers who think that they are doing a really good job at this. So that kind of divergence or that kind of schism in those perspectives is seen in a variety of other things too. Our, our global culture survey told us that particularly where we saw that divergence around things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the ability to bring your authentic self to work, that divergence was very pronounced in our global culture survey. Um, I think it was close to, uh, there was almost a 20 percentage points divergence, nearly 70% uh, of senior leaders and board members thought that they were doing a great job around things, for example, like being authentic leaders and bringing equity, diversity and inclusion to their organizations, but only 52% of their mid managers and staff would have agreed with them on that. So clearly this is something that we're seeing. And again, I think it's, it's as we've all sort of, you know, had to experience the last almost 24 months now, it's wearing on people. There's no question about it. Some of that notion about where perspectives are diverging though, I think also relates to preferences for remote work and what we're seeing happen there. And clearly one of the things we are seeing happen is, is that people's preferences for flexibility in their work is really starting to solidify. And in fact, it's probably been solidifying over the past nine months or more. And so one of the things that we know for sure around that is, is that, um, well, I'll give you the statistic. It's nearly 40% of the people that we surveyed in the office, office worker survey said they would prefer to work almost entirely remotely. So, and that's really probably a day a week, maybe in the office or completely remotely. So I think very consistent, Deborah, with what you were mentioning at the outset that you don't see yourself going back to the office. There's a lot of folks who share that perspective as well too. Although, you know, and I think a number of you have undoubtedly encountered this as well, one of the things that we know, and it goes to leadership credibility too, is, is that leaders have to be very conscious as they start to think about and set policies 
and, and, and reorient processes to support some form of flexible or hybrid model of work, they have to be very careful about their own biases in setting up those policies and those processes. And, and there's probably a couple that you've, many of you un undoubtedly have heard of. So we've got the, you know, the proximity bias for one. So if I'm a manager who chooses to work remotely, whereas some of my young team members wanna work in the office and the others are working remotely, I have to be really careful about making sure that, you know, I'm not sort of thinking about um, and, and treating the people who, who have similar ideas to me and who are similarly working remotely, or if I'm a manager, pardon me, in the office and I've got people working beside me in the office where I can see what they're doing versus others working remotely, I've gotta be really careful about how I approach that and whether I am ultimately injecting some of my own biases in that. And that would be things like, um, the other bias that's also a concern for us typically in this, um, which is my, I'm gonna find it. Um, yeah, I had it here a moment ago and I will find it for you guys. But anyway, it's basically a uh, similarity bias. And, it, and it's just, again, do we have people making decisions about policy who are looking at the world exclusively through their own lens, because that, that can have a very detrimental effect on organizations. And then finally, the last trend that we're talking about here is that upskilling, and we've been talking about upskilling for the past few years, in fact, it's still popular, people still view it as important, but from an employer perspective, they're actually seeing um, the benefits as maybe not being as great as perhaps at the beginning of the pandemic. And we would say that, you know, 24% actually of our employers are saying that, you know, they, they agree with upskilling, but they're not quite seeing that it's really making a significant difference in um, the ability of their employees or the productivity of their employees. And I'd say there's probably a couple of things that may underlie this. One of which of course is, is that we believe that people are making more targeted investments in upskilling. So, you know, certainly, and, and we as a firm, we're doing a lot of this ourselves. Um, one of the things that we experienced was that people wanted to um, have a lot of digital upskilling to help them and particularly to help them adapt quickly to the digitization of their work as they worked remotely. But I think now the shift is on to getting much more targeted and much more sort of focused on explicit needs of different segments in your organization. The other thing that I think has emerged that is a really important piece to all of this is how do we focus on the skills of our managers and leaders who we have over the past two years asked fundamentally different things of. Um, I often say to people that nobody went into this pandemic with a manual on how to lead and work remotely. People through their own resilience and their own adaptiveness have done an incredible job at finding their way through this. I think the really um, progressive, the really clever organizations that have done well through this pandemic have also understood that their managers and their leaders needed some support to help lead and manage in new ways, particularly as it's remote. So those are the, the important sort of five trends that I really wanna focus our conversation on. What I'd like to do though, is just give you the punchline, if you will, attached to this. And then we can certainly delve into any of the individual topics on this a bit more explicitly. So I will quickly, as it were, turn to, as I like to describe it, the punchline on this. And that's really how does this sort of affect and or what are the kinds of things that organizations need to take away from all of this? So I'm gonna whip through these other slides very quickly. Forgive me for this. Um, if we look at all of those trends taken together collectively, what does this mean? 
Um, for me, it's really that the future of work is clearly about, as we like to describe it, humanizing the workforce. And humanizing the workforce means understanding your people, understanding that they are not a homogenous group of citizens in your organization, understanding that they have various needs and preferences aligned with their different life needs um, and professional needs. And so flexibility becomes a critical concept in really helping organizations who are navigating effectively and setting themselves up for the future of work to build an inclusive environment and one that's going to attract and keep the talent that they want. So in terms of my five proposed takeaways for this, as I said, first and foremost, flexibility. Um, our preference towards hybrid options, as I said, is about flexibility, but flexibility in and of itself is about much more than where work gets done. Um, it's also about how we build flexibility into our support infrastructure, how we build flexibility into our people policies and our people processes. So ensuring mobility for employees and giving them clear development trajectories will help to provide that kind of flexible and differentiated experience that people want. Um, and, and if we think about just again, by way of example, what does, what does that mean say in terms of things like rewards? And I'm sure many of you have already started to experience this and or are doing this, but it's really about how do we look at and go beyond sort of traditional health and uh, you know, dental benefits and add things that make sense for the different segments of our workforce. So non-traditional benefits like paid time off to volunteer or um, in lieu of say variable enrollment in explicit upskilling programs or other things that might be welcomed by your employees. And in fact, some of our own survey work has told us that nearly a third of employees will value those non-traditional benefits. Younger workers, probably more so than older workers, as you can well imagine, are, are also the ones who are really sort of looking for that kind of flexibility in some of those things like rewards. But this is also too about thinking about your workforce and where they're working and how do we adjust policies and processes to reflect that? How do we adjust performance management to recognize that? How do we adjust leave policies to recognize, especially for those who can't have the opportunity to work remotely or things like that? So understanding and being able to build as much flex as is conceivable in your workforce is going to be an important part of how we move forward. Redefining productivity then for a, a hybrid or flexible work environment. And this is key. And a lot of this is about how do we re reorient how we look at and measure and manage performance? How do we focus on and create systems that are geared toward outcomes versus that traditional output orientation? Before I started consulting, um, I grew up in, in you know, a couple of government organizations and that environment at the time, 25 plus years ago, was very much about, as I like to describe it, bums and seats. And so if we can see people and see what they're doing, um, that becomes a much easier thing as a manager and as a leader to contend with. I understand that productivity better. I think the, so finding ways to adapt to an outcome-based system or create an outcome-based system is gonna be critical. The other thing that we know from research too is, is that whilst productivity levels have been going up, certainly in some organizations, the burden of that productivity has probably fallen on a few superstars as we like to say. And so the ability to really have a clearer line of sight to who is contributing and who may be contributing less and to be able to smooth that out from a retention standpoint is really gonna be critical. 
having a practical structured focus on mental health and well-being. So I mentioned already the ability to kind of rethink and flex your people programs um, around this is going to be absolutely critical. But it's also about creating and engendering a culture that really focuses on and emphasizes well-being. And people are you know, clearly going to be able to understand the importance of well-being and wellness in their organizations when they see their senior leaders doing it first. Establishing a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment. We have seen an incredible uptick in the number of requests that we get to help our clients with developing or enhancing or refreshing their own diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies for their organization. We're also, though, too, helping them with looking at their people processes. So particularly as they start to relook at them in the context of the pandemic, some are saying, I really need to understand better whether I have an inherent level of unconscious bias in my people process. So what biases are existing in my talent life cycle, for example? And the ability to do that um, and have that kind of clear and definitive answer is, it's not simple, but it's very doable. We rely on, as we describe it, a library of bias interrupters that we use to look at um, common biases that can occur, whether it's in the uh, recruitment, attraction part of the talent life cycle, whether it's in the performance management part of the life cycle or the development part of the life cycle. Creating an inclusive and diverse environment is absolutely integrally linked to making sure that we are conscious of and we are ridding, ideally, our processes of those kinds of biases. The other aspect that I just want to touch on briefly in terms of creating that equitable, diverse, and inclusive environment is that we need to have clear, open conversations about what is or isn't happening in our workplaces. And those diversity, equity, and inclusion aspirations need to be clearly linked back to our purpose and to our goals as a business. And then finally, creating a distinctive and authentic culture. I think um, of all the, the sort of things that we've seen occur over the course of the pandemic is, is clearly that awareness that employee experience is critical. We are living now more than ever in a world where the dynamic, if you will, has shifted towards employees. Uh, the war for talent, by the way, started long before, as most of you know, long before the pandemic. Um, the pandemic did not create many of these things that I've just mentioned. I like to say that really it's been an accelerant. It's thrown gas on the fire, so to speak. And so when we talk about employee experience and we talk about the links with culture, we know how important now more than ever it is to really focus on the kind of culture that we want. And we know too from our, our global culture survey that I mentioned that creating that kind of culture um, was for our survey respondents integrally linked to their ability and their reporting that they felt they better navigated the pandemic. I should also say too that their employees similarly agreed that they better navigated the pandemic. So there's a triangulation here between how well we did as a business, um, the kind of culture we have, and the congruence between what our employees and what leaders were saying about both of those things. And the trait that we like to say um, probably drives that is the fact that we have leaders that have created that kind of culture where people feel good about bringing their authentic selves to work, where they would say that leaders are walking the talk consistently, and where they would also say that um, 
authenticity and, and inclusion are integral parts of their organization. So I think I've probably gone over my 15 minutes, Deborah, but um, perhaps I can, I can turn it back to um, the conversation and um, take any questions from there. Uh, so interesting, um, Kathy, and um, I think if you could stop sharing your screen, Kathy. I certainly will. Yeah. Okay, let me do that. Would that. Be great. So, um, you know, I can start off unless there's anybody who's just hankering to get in with a <laughs> question. Um, if you are, just put it in the chat. I have a, you know, this was fantastic and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I had a question about the productivity at a couple actually that I found mm -hmm. very interesting because of course we hear the anecdotes and I love the comment about bias because I hear anecdotes from some employers that say, you know, my productivity isn't great. And I don't know if that's a perception and often tied to employers who don't like the work from home concept. So okay. they expect that. And so when you say it's ramping up, where would it be ramping up from when to when? Pre-pandemic? I'd say, uh, well, actually, I'd say that we have seen sort of a progressive uptick. So, um, and so, yes, I'd say that what the conclusion or the more recent conclusion was that was drawn was, you know, we're seeing more and more people. So the productivity is ramped up, but the finding is that more and more people are recognizing too that their productivity has gone up mm. and is actually either equal to or in excess of pre-pandemic levels. It's the matter of how that productivity has gone up and the, the balance, if you will, against wellness and against... Um, some of the other things that we're seeing, you know, as I said, that sort of superstar phenomenon in the workforce. Um, one of the interesting things, and I read an article recently that I thought was really, really important in all of this. I think that, you know, we all live in very busy world. And I think that the sort of lack of separation for those who are working remotely between the office and between home has just certainly compounded that busyness to it. Um, an article that I read recently talked about something that called slow productivity. And that doesn't mean that we've reduced productivity, but it's really about saying, how do we, probably in simple terms, how do we kind of focus back on what's really important to our organization, our business, as we make decisions to take on yet another task, or yet another project for something. So it would be easy for me to just kind of, you know, tap into my people and go, well, here, um, so and so here, Mary, I'd love it if you could just do this and, you know, becoming a side of the desk project. We know our folks have too many side of the desk projects in addition to their regular work. And I think that tendency to just continuously pile on to say we're getting things done is part of what has certainly maybe contributed to some of that productivity, but also contributed to that sort of constant stress that people are feeling about things and particularly about not getting things done. So what this concept of slow productivity was really about was saying, look, you're gonna get the same urgent things done essentially, but through having that discipline and probably some sort of structured framework and process for discerning, do I need to do this now? And probably too, giving your people autonomy to say, okay, boss, if I take this thing on right now, this other thing you asked me to do is going to either have to come off the list or go way down the list. And, and it's, again, I think in very simple terms about creating focus and people landing themselves at the other side with the same amount of critical productivity being the result. Yeah, and I love that you're saying that because I've noticed in with all of my coaching clients the last two years, one of the key things that I'm focusing on is exactly that issue that um, 
it just feels that there's a lot of me included, right? Uh, the end when we come up to the holidays, everybody feeling so burnt out because we're. It just feels different than when we were busy before with a group around us. It feels mentally harder, and so I'm working a lot with my clients on okay, how do you prioritize? And then how do you help your people prioritize so that you manage your own expectations of their output? Um, so people who are used to being overachievers are really mentally uh, suffering. Uh, they are. It, it just seems different. And I don't know how if other people are, are noticing or feeling that themselves. I'm so, I certainly feel it. Indeed. And that's our superstars, you know, that's our, our overachievers, our superstars who probably are in, in, in certainly in some instances, um, carrying the burden on the additional productivity in some organizations. And it's part of our human tendency. I know certainly as leaders, we tend to go to without thinking, we tend to go to those folks that we know are going to deliver for us. Mm -hmm. So they naturally become overloaded and they continue to deliver. So that certainly contributes to the kind of challenges that we're seeing. And it's so much easier, as you say, in this environment to say, oh, I can just work for another half an hour or another hour or whatever it is, because I don't have to worry about my commute to or from those little mental breaks that we were able to take before. I know for me personally, even that little trip home at the end of the evening, down the gardener or first thing in the morning, boy, those things do make um, a real difference in terms of your ability to shift mentally to your home environment, even if you have to do some more work at your home environment, um, both in terms of your family, but also in terms of your, your profession. So. And you know, the other thing, and then um, I'll go to Paul, is I think because those of us in, in full or semi-lockdown, like there really is nothing else to do. Yes. <laughs> Nowhere to exactly. go. So you just go, exactly. oh, well, I'll just take a peek. It's like going down the exactly. rabbit hole, the email rabbit hole, because like, where else am I going to go, right? Kind of sick of Netflix. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I like to say, say to my husband that he's, he's finally found his way to the end of the Netflix universe or whatever. So he's, but uh, I agree. So Paul, you, you made some really good points and questions. So why don't you, uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Deborah. Um, great presentation, Kathy. Um, thank, thank you. you. A couple of qu questions I had around flexibility. One is I talked to clients around their benefits and, you know, the flexibility, 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 but it doesn't necessarily come cheap. Are, as you're having conversations, are organizations understanding and willing that to go down the flexible path may increase the cost of doing business and, and the trade-offs with that? And then the, the second question was, and it might be too soon, is as we talk about flexibility in the context of every, anything, whether it's work-life balance or, or yeah. working in the office or what have you, are, is there a risk we go too far and everything's <laughs> flexible and some people might not want flexibility just tell me where I need to be tell me what I need to do and I don't want to have to pick choose everything great question great question um, maybe to address the first part Paul you know we're just actually starting to have some of these kinds of conversations as it pertains to the piece around benefit so I, I'd have to say maybe it's too early to tell I'd say the one thing I would say though on that point is is that the people who are investigating this though, are also the people who are trying to be very proactive about defining what their future of work looks like for their organization, because they've made that clear link and shift to understanding that this is gonna be critical for me being an employer of choice, for being someone who will draw people in. And particularly that, that younger workforce, but also too, I, I, you know, I don't want to focus exclusively on the younger workforce as the only people wanting flexibility. I mean, some of that could easily be baby boomers and could easily be others who want different forms of flexibility as well. I think though, you know, those who are recognizing this is important now are probably the ones who, who also understand there may be some cost associated for them, but it also for them may be the cost of you know, there may be some offsets, I'll, I'll say this, in terms of the kinds of things that they're thinking about um, 
as far as the cost of losing people. Um, particularly if you've just got somebody and somebody goes quickly or you're losing corporate knowledge and memory because you're losing somebody with tenure. So I think there may be some offset, but there, there certainly could be a cost associated with this, but I think it's, you know, good news. Those who are, who are more progressive are starting to think about some of that. Um, on the second part about flexibility and going too far, um, certainly, I think there's always room for hyperbole in any kind of situation. I think the point with flexibility um, and, and getting it right is it starts with really understanding what it is that your people want. So I mentioned at the outset, PwC has been um, surveying and really listening to its employees since the start of the pandemic. So I'd say within the first month or, or even couple of weeks of the start of our remote working experiment, um, we have a internal tool that we use called um, something that our, our own products people actually uh, identified, developed and built for us. Uh, we call it ActiveBot. And basically it's just a, a little bot that pushes out uh, a couple of questions survey, which is a constant sentiment gathering opportunity for us. So that really helps and has helped um, our senior leadership who are really understanding and trying to frame what our future of work is. And I know lots of other organizations are doing that kind of listening. I think the point of that kind of listening and really understanding the employee experience that you need to have is, is not to say that we're going to create you know, if we have a thousand employees, a thousand different experiences, but to understand what does flexibility mean for us relative to the kind of organization we are, our business goals, our sense of purpose, and the kind of environment that we're, we're trying to create for our employees. So there's going to be certain bounds on it, but I think figuring out what that corridor to operate within is really the purview of the organization itself and has to be consistent with their purpose, their goals and their mission. Hope that's okay, Paul. Good. <laughs> um, I'll turn to Vita, please. Hi, good morning. So my question is really around uh, purpose and, va and, and values and connecting the employer employee. And there was a lot of discussion well before the pandemic. You, you, Kathy, you talked about the expedition of what the pandemic has provided all of us. And we've, yeah. I, I know I've said the same thing. To what degree, like, where does this go from here? Like, I, I, I'm unclear, like I have an idea, but what do you predict as important <laughs> uh, pieces for us to think about as yeah. we redefine or shape culture? Because culture is like this intangible, it's a feeling, it's a, it's a, it, and, and you see it in your work processes, but what degree do you think this shifts for us? Uh, great question, Vita, and thank you for that. Um, I'd say a couple of things. First and foremost, um, while I don't have a crystal ball, <laughs> I'll try to rely on the data as much as possible. And, you know, some of the other, <coughs> excuse me, data gathering that we've done as PwC has told us that I think nearly three quarters of CEOs, and this was done late, late 2020, have basically acknowledged that, look, some form of flexible work is here to stay. So, you know, we are not, despite what you see in some industries, we are not, it's not about, we're gonna to return to exactly what was prior to uh, the start of the pandemic in March, 2020. Um, so with that kind of recognition, that's where I'd say that a lot of folks have really started to focus on and understand what is the environment that we need to create? Um, because we're recognizing that if this is remote, we have people that will not be sort of sitting at head office or within the confines of, of a building. And, and this goes to something actually that I say to other folks and our culture survey results bore this out. Culture is not something that sits inside the confines of your four walls. And that was true before the pandemic as well. And I think one of the things that you know was very clear was we were already starting to see the shift in the workforce. So 
more and more organizations relying on um, you know, contingent workforce, contractor workforce to help deliver on their mission and their mandate. And so when you have that, you clearly are already dealing with a workforce that is not an inherent permanent part of you, but you are still expecting them to actually represent your culture, whether it's in interacting with the people who are part of your core workforce or interacting with your clients, your customers, your, your stakeholders. So that trend to having culture kind of permeate outside was already there. So I think the emphasis has to be, how do we create environments where people feel connected, even if it isn't in a physical sense connected? that's going to continue and that need is going to continue and i think flexibility and inclusivity don't just come by having physical proximity to people or having you know especially inclusivity doesn't come just by having proximity to people one of the things that the pandemic's taught us too especially in terms of remote work is is that some you know there, there's some significant challenges that it just really elevated that uh, a lot of um, racialized groups experience on a day-to-day -day basis when they were in the office. So we saw a lot of um, statistics tell us, you know, there are a lot of, you know, black professionals who frankly didn't want to go back to the office because they don't want to continue to experience some of the same microaggressions that had unfortunately been part of their experience. So in many respects, creating an environment where they can feel whole and much more safe and much more part of things, whether it's, it's you know, any of our um, BIPOC professionals and employees is really about creating the right culture. And that doesn't mean it has to be physically on site to do that. But that also too goes back to my point about it's gonna take a special kind of leader to be able to do that. And it really means that I think we have to really focus on who we are making leaders, how we are developing those leaders, what are the skills that we are consistently emphasizing. I know for many years, agility continues to be one of those competencies that lands in everybody's competency model. But I think what it really means has probably been um, highlighted and accelerated over the past two years and I think for leaders, it's their ability to be flexible, but their ability to work with flexible systems that will really be part of what defines and makes the culture one that people want to belong to and one that also makes people productive too. And just really quickly to your point too, Vito, that culture is that amorphous thing. It is one of the important connections though, in it, it is, or it can be, I should say in some respects, but one of the important connections we've been making with people and, you know, not to, uh, sorry to, for the commercial, but our cats and back framework that we use does is it's very clearly connecting employee experience with um, strategy. We know that the right culture is always one that's connected to strategy where it's disconnected from strategy is where culture falls apart, is where culture doesn't work. And our survey that we did that I said where folks felt that, you know, their leaders and their organization had navigated the pandemic better, there's also lots of congruence that they would say occurs between the culture that they have and understand and the direction of their business. So, Sorry, just a few things for you to consider. Hopefully that, that gives you um, some idea, Vita, in terms of the way forward from here. Uh, I think you know there's lots of opportunity in the way forward from here too, just to be clear. Thanks. Um, Dean has, uh, he put in the chat some interesting mm -hmm. statistics and uh, Dean, if you could ask your question, because you know, and I'll tag on if it's okay, um, Kathy, with Please. the other side of the coin, which is the concern about no FaceTime, especially with younger employees and recognition and yes. promotion and stuff. And Dean, if you wouldn't mind making your point. Sure, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had posted um, a Harvard Business Review article. It was really good. And um, 
and they focused on, as you said, you know, one policy no longer fits all. And then you really yeah. have to be flexible and, and look at all of the different groups. And it hit on exactly your point about, you know, the, uh, those in the minority and how uncomfortable they're feeling and we're feeling going into the office, uh, as well as, you know, looking at the disabled, for instance, and, and what does yeah. this mean uh, for them? And what can you do as employers? But a couple of interesting stats um, that I shared in the chat that more than 90% of the employers are planning to adopt a hybrid model in 2022. So to your point that uh, it is pretty high. But the, the, the second one, which is more interesting, I'd just love to get your thoughts on 64% of managers and executives <laughs> believe in-office employees are higher performers than remote employees. And you touched on that at the beginning. But the second part, 76% believe in-office workers are more likely to be promoted. That one I thought was interesting. <laughs> it, it is an interesting stat, and, and really thanks for that, Dean. Um, our, our survey didn't necessarily cover that latter point explicitly, except um, you know, in terms of our own other research, as I said, about proximity bias and really making sure that we are as leaders conscious of that bias. So um, just as a for instance, as, as to what, um, what we know, you know, I think there has to be, and that's where flexibility comes into play here. There has to be some sort of way or understanding to give that kind of connection for whether it's young workers, for example, who are at the start of their careers, who are craving perhaps some of the kind of mentoring that the last, you know, 20 months or more has not really allowed in the same manner that it would have been when I started my career or perhaps when you started your career. And, and so that's one of those things that has to be part of the focus of how do leaders look at and understand the needs of their workforce using the data ideally that you know the organization is providing them because the organization that's listening to their employees is also likely the organization that is more apt to be able to make the right decisions about what to do and how much flexibility or how little flexibility is right for for their workforce ultimately um, i do think it's interesting too that 64 percent in this one it's, I'm sure that's probably a US-based survey as well, I would suspect. So given that it's HBR, um, but that 64% of managers believe that they're higher performers because ours was very clearly um, focused on the fact that we acknowledge that productivity is actually higher with people working remotely. So in other words, quite the opposite of that. And that, you know, or I should say, it's at least as high, if not higher, than it was when people were exclusively in the office. So I think it's it's a really interesting sort of um, bit of a cross-border divergence, I guess, if you will, between the two work environments. Um, and maybe too, it speaks to, because certainly we've seen lots of things uh, in terms of you know particular sectors of the economy down south saying, hey, everybody has to come back to the office regardless. So this probably reflects some of that sentiment that you're seeing versus our employers and consistently so too, by the way, in several of the, uh, of the surveys that we have conducted have recognized that there are important things they need to do for their employees to make them successful whilst they work remotely kind of thing. So, and again, recognizing that remote work in some fashion is here to stay. And, and, you know, I think it's interesting too, Kathy, that when you talk about, you know, the issue around productivity and then promotability. And so what are the blind spots that, that leaders have that they have to learn about? Because what, what are the things that we look at that make me or you or anybody promotable, right? Exactly. And, and, and because we're all about FaceTime and the small p politics, of an office, the political environment has really changed once we've gone remotely. And it's interesting because I onboard all of our new executive hires and the, the political piece is very tricky because oh, all of yeah. those um, 
kind of touch points you have to read the room and read the person, you know, so you can kind of get the feel. Those are, are gone. So um, it, it is much more difficult for sure, Deborah. And again, it really kind of, as I say, goes to sort of new skills or new tools that we're all developing to some degree to be able to cope and understand those environments. Um, I like to say that, you know, because I have had the opportunity to have, I'll say a handful of, of in-person meetings over the past six months, clearly not as, as Omicron befell us in early December onward, but that, that sort of sense of the, I call it the three-dimensional person is finally there really does just, you know, it, it makes it easier and more comfortable to fall back into what we all know so well and our natural ability to read a situation, as you say. But I think the shift that people are making and, and understanding is, is that virtual work is going to be the norm. So there are some, some cues, some clues, and some innate skills, if you will, that we have to develop to really help facilitate that shift. Every time we, we you know, we're, we're looking to get to a place, to be quite honest, um, and I'm not saying it's easy, but we're looking to a place to, to get to a place where that virtual environment becomes the norm. And that by the norm, that really means it's habit for people. It's really about, um, as we like to say, that, that sort of um, unconscious competence at doing it. It has just become simply stated habit and part of how we do business. So. So we have two more questions in three minutes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get through them all. Shahana, if you would like to uh, ask your question, um, if you're still here, I don't know if she is. <laughs> okay, I don't see her coming. Kim? Hi, oh, sorry, I was on. talking on mute and uh, it's been two years and still haven't figured it out. <laughs> Can you come on screen? Sorry. Can you can you come on screen, please, Johanna? So we see you. Ah, uh, sorry. One second. Is it working now? No. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, great discussion, everybody. Very very insightful. Um, my question was more pertaining to my organization as to how we are viewing a return to work and how we are mm -hmm. viewing the future of work. We, we come from a culture where collaboration is the key. We do have a lot of diverse teams who work together and um, there's still that notion of collaborative work being done better when being done in person. So I wanted to understand if there are any insights from the survey or insights that you have as to what the employees really want if they are to come back into the workplace, into the office, what would, what would make it worth it for them? That's a great question, Shahana. Thank you for that. Um, I think what we're seeing and, and what the, the research seems to be telling us uh, fairly consistently is, is that you know, employees want some variability on this, you know, even if it's predominantly, you know, if it, it leans towards remote or work from home, they want sort of some variability, some opportunity, but they also want to make sure if they are coming back, that it's a safe environment, that it's, um, you know, they, they want to really also to understand who else is going to be there if they're younger folks so they can have that sense of community. Just as an example, I know in our PwC downtown offices, for example, that's one of the reasons why in our initial sort of aftermath of the first wave, why we contemplated opening up because quite honestly, um, our, our young people, that is about their community, their professional community also for many of them becomes a personal community and they live in the downtown core and they're, they're looking for those kinds of interactions to feel that sense of community. So in some respects, it might've been less about their bosses and more about the ability to be with their peers that way. So I think that's part of the experience that people want too, is that sense of, of connectedness and of, um, you know, that to have that physical sense of community. But I think collaboration, because you mentioned that, 
there are lots of ways that collaboration can occur and it doesn't necessarily have to be, as you said, within um, the confines of a physical space. I think one of the things that organizations are doing is, is understanding exactly the nature of work that has to occur inside those offices. So there are different kinds of collaboration as well. What kinds of collaboration really needs to occur inside an office versus the kinds that can still be facilitated through a lot of the incredible infrastructure, technology infrastructure that exists today to do that. So I think the ability to discern who needs to be in the office and for what purposes and how, you know, whether it's collaboration or some other distinct purpose, that's an important part of how people are deciding both the extent of their flexibility in their remote environment, but also what does the office itself actually look like? What is it that people are going back to and how does it create that sense of, you know, in, uh, inclusion, safety, all those things that I talked about. I hope that answers. Thanks. Yeah, um, Thank you so much. Kathy, and believe it or not, I mean, we're at an hour. And it's not enough time. So we had one more question. What I've, I've told, um, Kim, who's asked the question that Kathy, I'm going to email you that question if Perfect. that's okay with you. And Perfect. then whoever is interested in Kathy's emailed response, just email me and I'll get it uh, out to you. And before you all rush off, you know, this has been recorded. I'm going to post it on my uh, LinkedIn upload and at my YouTube channel. And Kathy, so many thanks for this. Um, you can tell by, you know, the questions that we could keep on going on. It's such a big topic. Um, hopefully, as you develop more research and more findings, maybe we can invite you back. And I encourage everybody to connect with uh, Kathy on LinkedIn. If uh, I'm sure you'll be open to discussions and questions and um, sharing your knowledge with, with anybody who reaches out to you. Absolutely delighted. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you again to everyone for the opportunity. It was, um, I really enjoyed the discussion and the chance to talk about this. Such an important topic. So important. Thanks so much. We're very grateful to you and to all of our participants. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, have a great, great day, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, you as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.